Hello there. Welcome to another Azure centric podcast on our Azure weekly updates. My name is Marcos Nogueira and I want to welcome you again, once again, Andrew. Uh, I've been welcoming you for the past 50 or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, some, something, something, something like that. <laughs> Look, we should call it bi-weekly updates at uh, our recent pace. No, I no. Think- We'll, we'll get better. Yes, we'll get better. yes, absolutely. But <laughs> welcome uh, another weekly, another good week of, of on Azure. We've been so busy that we changes and and changes of scenery, as you can see um, on the on the YouTube channel. If you are in this case, listen to us. Just go there to see the the change of scenery regarding um, Andrew. Now it's it. You'll have- You'll have noticed the last few episodes, everything started Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It, it was it was you on vacations for not vacations on on a deserve location to rest for a long time, which is good and well deserve it. Uh, but now you are new new life, new year, new house. So that's congratulations yes. for this. There's a, there's a lot of <laughs> new things. And, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm both overwhelmed and full of gratitude. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, nonetheless, thank you for inviting Absolutely. me back. Uh, in this Absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate that. So we, we had kind of a busy week in, in Azure. It was, it was interesting because it didn't look like there was a lot. But when we kind of went through, there was actually quite a few good articles Absolutely. in there and some really great updates. That it does. I think the, the major theme is, uh, let's say, monitoring and money. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. One of my, one of my passions are around, uh, you know, keeping yeah. an eye on things in, in our system. Absolutely. Um, we we may make a bit more than an honorable mention of it. Yeah, we, I've, you know. no, I've, yeah. And the funny thing is, uh, we were. I, I was um, having a talk with with a friend of mine, saying that one of the things that I love is to save money for my customers, and a lot of times they don't value that, right? Because they only see that at the end. But it's it's always in in our minds. Uh, right on our mindset, it's it's like security is the top one, um, the integration with applications and everything else, but costs exactly. is there. So it is. It's a driving factor. In fact, it's one of the pillars is. of good design. Exactly right? because it's so easy so to do with much, have right? To consider that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we need to consider those things as part of kind of a good overall structure. But it's also part of fiscal responsibility, right? So if we think of kind of our own pocketbook at home, we balance the checking account. We we keep an eye on, you know, how many um, different uh, toys we buy from uh, Microsoft Store, and <laughs> all those good things. And I and I joke, but it it is a real it is. thing, right? Like we have to watch how much absolutely. We buy. And it's no different for a business; they have to watch how much they buy and where that money's going. And good management of those costs is really part of fiscal responsibility for the business right and we have absolutely to have it reminds me of some of those slogans that we see like do more with less something like that <laughs> <laughs> something i'll do up a little yeah. a <laughs> something like that but yeah that's that's the magic that we have that we have in our in our lives right so it's it's pretty cool what we are trying to achieve but nevertheless um we are back we want to thank you in this case that you are listening uh, that you are seeing us um on on the different channels that azure centric have and if you are new to the channel uh, don't forget to subscribe um because it helps us a lot uh, spreading the word spreading the, the the message spreading the love and if you really like us uh, just give us a, thumb, a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you don't. We, we, we... Absolutely. We always encourage open and free Absolutely. feedback. And, uh, if you're really not a fan, we always offer a money-back guarantee. Uh, anything you paid to uh, watch the podcast <laughs> yeah. will re- will refund your money, uh, although we didn't get exactly. any. So. <laughs> so far, at least, I didn't see anything, but that's okay. Uh, 
That's true. Let's <laughs> let's jump into the into the podcast then and to let's roll in this case and come back after that. So welcome back. Let's jump into the first update. So this week, the first update is the general availability of application gateway Mutual authentication. So we're starting really well. So it's GA, so now you can use it. And it's application gateway Mutual authentication. So what does that mean, Mutual authentication? Why is that important? uh for for day-to-day -day operations in this case andrew so one of the things that this does is it really extends the support for the listener specific tls policies and that allows us to use either kind of the pre-canned templates that are available with app gateway or we can build custom tls policies so a good example of that is if we have a custom port that our application uses, we can do um, kind of a, a pass through with that. So we can mask the port that the application is using in the back end versus the front end. We can kind of increase security. So we have to, of course, be careful with our designs, but uh, this is one of the, one of the things that uh, it can really help with. And of course, the other thing with the mutual authentication, that's where you upload that trusted client CA or certificate authority. And then on the app gateway, the gateway uses that certificate to authenticate those clients sending a request to the gateway. So it really helps to improve the overall yes. security. And this is commonly used, we see in IoT um, yeah. devices, for example, right? Where we, we have a lot of... Um, kind of data coming back and forth. This is one way to help us secure that yeah. data um, so that we can make sure there's no prying eyes on the o o over the network transmission. Through Absolutely. Internet. And the part that I like about the, especially the multi authentication um, is on the normal, uh, on traditional way that we're deploying, we have the authentication only on the application gateway, in this case, on the, on the destination, not at the source. In this case, and exactly. with this mood authentication, before we establish any type of communication, both the source and destination, they need to authenticate to each other. So we are increasing uh, the strength in this case of security, going towards what we always preaching in this case to our customer, that is the zero trust networking posture, mm -hmm. because now both sides are authenticated. On a traditional way, we only have, in this case, the back end uh, be able to authenticate. So the no matter where you're coming from, you authenticate on the back end. And if you are OK, if you have that certificate, that's good. But the thing is, you, that certificate, if it's a public one, for example, you will always authenticate against that. But you cannot, you right. cannot authenticate on the source. So it was a kind of... Uh, it was good to establish that communication, but anyone can connect with application gateway. In this case, what you can do is you need to have both certificates on both sides, okay, to establish that communication and to establish the authentication. So it reminds me of those policies that you are that you are talking about regarding the TLS that the default was uh, require. Uh, no, not require. It's request, but not. Uh, it was requested, but it allows you to do it. In this case, it's required yes. to have that certificate authentication to be able to authenticate. Other than that, what's going? What this increase of security going to do is, if you are not authenticating on the source, you cannot establish communication with this application gateway. Right. And, and and that's the part that I like about this update is is now you are strengthening those security postures regarding those zero trust networking, and it really allows the two way. So it's not only the backend, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think the other thing that we should say is, 
Um, if you're working on doing the testing, for example, uh, like a POC or something like that, you don't have to use um, kind of the like a top level certificate uh, from a certificate authority. You yeah. can use self signed, uh, and of course, the the catch with those is always that almost all browsers now will come up and say, "Hold on, this is a self signed certificate. Do you really want to trust this and go to this site?" So you will get a warning when you use it, but sometimes that's okay for initial testing, just as a absolutely kind of a yeah. Way. Using the, the self service certificate is one way. Although you have to deploy that self-serve certificates in all Everywhere. the devices that you are connecting to. <laughs> so it's doable exactly. for a testing, but it's not practical. Just spend <laughs> 150 bucks. You'll spend more in time trying to yeah. fix it. Or you can use one of the Azure certificates. It's 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 working as well. Oh, absolutely. What a, so that's a really yeah, absolutely. Point, right? <laughs> take, take advantage of that. that. The next one, it's talk about money. Public preview on mm -hmm. cost management anomaly detections for subscription. And I have to say that this topic is, is one of the topics that we like about, about talking with, uh, with our customers. And this particular one, it was overdue because these yeah. anomalies. So this is, this is something that we've had to write custom logic for, for uh, what's the phrase we have to use here? A dog's <laughs> age, right? Yes. <laughs> and this is really, really great stuff. So um, kind of cost anomaly detection has been available in partner cost management for EA agreements um, that have cost management enabled, but not for your own, right? So not for kind of the, the common tenant scenario. And even if you're under your own EA and you operate in kind of as a small medium space business, um, and I don't, I don't want to try and define small and medium space businesses here. So I'm going to, I'm going to downplay that. Yeah. There. But um, it's really good because what it does is if something say we expect it to run in the budget $200 a month, all of a sudden it costs $400. It can generate some alerts and let us know that it's overrunning. So it's more than just kind of setting budget alerts. It's it's more than that. It's it expected a forecasted cost was X, and then it was you know X plus one. It yeah. tells us about that. Um, it's really 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 great feature, and I agree. Long overdue Absolutely. for general uh, general release, and I can't wait to see how this public preview plays out. And um, you know I'm already in there. Yeah, looking at and, it. and and <laughs> this is it starts to open different things, right? While I was listening to you, I was going on my mind on different scenarios that this, this can be applied for. So one of them is, is like the example, as you can see on the blog post. So uh, I apologize if you are listening, uh, in this case, to one of the audios. Uh, just go to the, to the blog post and then you will see it that that's a very good example because it's starting to trigger and it's starting to make sense all the things together. So, for example, if you miss something um, and now he analyze, and the beauty of this is they are putting a lot of AI into this, even to the costs, right? To predict yeah. and, and to see it and to analyze what is your current cost, what's going to be your upcoming cost, what's going to be the cost that you had on the, on the last month, something like that, and gives you that information. So... It it's allows you to set alerts for not spending too much. Of course, that is one of the concerns. But this example over here, it's, it's, it's starting to setting you up for different things. Like if you don't have the right type of um, management or governance on your, this is, could be another way that you can be alerted to something goes wrong. So the example says that estimated costs decreased 748 percent on September 28 compared by compared to the average daily using during the last 60 days. So if you add a decrease of 748, you should be very happy because you are saving money. 
but this could be something else that someone okay starting deleted a, a lot of a lot of things right and exactly. could be dangerous for you because you have remember you have a time of window that you might be able or not to recover from those these crises of costs it's not only that you are saving a tons of money and should be you be you be yay i'm saving money but it could be someone that this is another way that 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 you can see it because they don't have this the insights of the billing right and they can exactly. try to uh, remove all the alerts and all of that but this billing is sure. another way that you can save it so it's not only cost it's if you think out loud it's going to be way more than that right it is yeah and i'm, I'm thinking of uh, an example that kind of you and i actually recently worked with um on a, on a project together using data lake analysis yep. services so if you suspend the analysis service you save lots of money but what if that analysis has to complete and get other processes done what if we have say a logic app written that is triggering at the wrong time or too often or something it just got misconfigured and it's running suspending that analysis service when we need it to be running so before our customers tell us that, hey, the analysis didn't complete, we didn't get the data that was done the way we were expecting it to be kind of fully baked, uh, we got this half-baked stuff, what's going on? You may be able to get, like take this and translate it into an insight where you can actually prevent problems that filter down within your own kind of chain of business, right? So this is like applying the AI to um, cost management and uh, in a very similar way to how they've done with Azure Monitor, um, this is this is going to be really cool when it kind of absolutely and, and 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 we are just exploring some of those scenarios, right? And 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 oh, it's exactly. it's massive because it works for both ways, from the way that you are saving money and the way that you are increasing as well, right? So it, exactly. it gives you a little bit more insight. And a little bit more secure on what's going on on, on on that. But using your segue about Azure Monitor, the next update is the public preview of the new capabilities for Azure Monitor Locks. So the best segue that, that we can have. Thank you for that. So from the few, um, in this case, new capabilities, there is one that it's just basically pop-ups to my to my um, eyes that is the long-term archiving for security logs and compliance so mm -hmm. usually those are the achilles when we talk about logs because it's always going to be the dilemma of how long do i get those logs why do i need exactly. those logs right and all of that so now be able to storing those logs for seven years uh, at the significant price reduction is massive yeah this is big right because the one that jumped out at me and i think there's some let's say kind of um interesting outcomes yeah. that we can kind of talk around here is the process your logs during ingestion yes. transforming and doing all of your querying using a subset of something that is very very much across all of azure now which is kql right so custo query language so if we think of how sql became the standard kql is becoming that's kind of same level of standard where it's just very popular and prevalent so when we think about, um, and I, I, I don't want to dive down the rabbit hole here, but I get really excited about seven years of log retention because the first thing I think of is the seam and source systems for Microsoft yeah. Sentinel, right? So one of the things that we always have kind of trouble figuring out with our customers is how long do we really need to exactly. keep those logs, 
right? And it, there is no right answer here. It really depends on so many gosh darn variables and it's very much business specific. So only you can determine with the help of some, some experts what the right Absolutely. answer is there. Right? So often it's six months, could be yeah. seven years. So Microsoft went to the top end of this, like absolutely amazing for me, because now we have that super price reduction for that seven years of log retention. It's really going to help customers to be better prepared and build better security postures overall. And that's a big deal. It's not only that, it's like years. having the E3. So be able to compare, exactly. right, what is going on on that application with happening right now. It goes to one of the things that we love about, about Sentinel is the behavioral, uh, in this case, uh, AI that goes and compare what's going on previously, seven years ago to now. Yes, you say that probably seven years ago, that application have a different OS, a different whatever it is, but still, um, if it's, it, it, you can still compare. And like you mentioned, that part of process your logs during injection, it brings more to the real time that usually the logs, it's going to be reactive because it needs to happen. Exactly. You need to export the logs. The logs needs to be there. And you now you need, you can query, but that time frame usually it's, it could be long. So, now when you are injecting those logs you can even query you are close to the real time of what is going to happen or what is happening at that precision time so it's pretty cool to have both scenarios the long term saving money and in this case the injection almost in real time to just be able to query those those absolutely um other things that that they are saying is the full power to your own logs. So new table management APIs creates and updates the customer and build the table schemas. So it's pretty cool to have your power of your own logs. So this is like, you can create and support uh, a lot of other logs, a lot of other adventure features that you have the possibility of creating your custom logs APIs. Uh, so okay. it's it's pretty powerful uh besides that you can now search relevant logs out of petabytes of data that's another another capability that you can have it but yeah it's 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 massive what they are doing and this is just with logs i know we sound a little bit a, li a little bit uh, <laughs> uh, kind of geek how excited we are with logs but it's our life on the past 20 years that we've been working on this it logs it becomes like something that that we almost try yeah. do you have the log for this what about well remember you have any you know troubleshooting yeah. 101 tell me what was in the event logs right <laughs> tell me what was in exactly the log, the it's like log, the when we have log. something new in the cup did you check the logs <laughs> i even have a friend uh and we know both our, our good friend uh, uh, Dave Kula, mm. that he have check your logs yeah. .net. Uh, check their, their, their yeah. blog, it's really good. And by the way, awesome yeah. site where a lot of other MVPs Absolutely. come together and publish their articles. But what an amazing resource to help you when you have a problem. Um, they have some amazing information. I've used it myself. Oh, my yeah, life. absolutely. <laughs> no, no, no questions asked about that. Yeah. But talking about tables and not the tables and all of that i think it's it's the good segue for the next one the general availability of custom retention for azure activity and usage data tables so pretty cool to have this azure activity right so yeah exactly. so what do you think about this update <laughs> terrible <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> I should have that one out. It's, it's amazing, right? So, terrible, um, amazing, right? The ability or amazing, or terrible, yeah. <laughs> terrible, whatever. amazing. Yeah. I can't help myself, right? So when I, I, I get excited, I always joke, as you know. So um, it's daylight. What can I say? It is. Um, this, the seasons are going to change. It's going to happen. So this is really cool. 
because this gives us the ability to kind of enhance our usage a little bit around Azure Activity. So we use Azure Activity is kind of the log, hey, somebody's provisioned a VM, somebody changed a VM, somebody deleted a VM and different resources. I'm picking on VMs, but it's you know just the easy example. So if we have the basic audit enabled on our operations, then this gives us a really kind of an enhancement to not only like we were talking about logging um, and the last update, it is really important because it gives us that way that we can audit things. We can be um, crafting a reactive approach. Now, this gives us a really good retention, right? So if we set that date to 90, um, that's kind of the default. A lot of tenants only have the 30 day yes. retention up until now. So this is just such a huge, huge impact. Um, what jumps out on this one for you? Um, I, I don't want to even want, I could talk. No, uh, it's, second, it's <laughs> literally like that. So it's to have a different minimum uh, in this case, retention, it's, it's what it is basically. So, and the good thing is you can do it this uh, from different perspectives, right? Uh, uh, the, the, the 90 days minimum, it's, it's pretty cool. Like you said, um, the, the be able to do this by either a rest API or even to CLI, it's another way that you can, you can do it. So you can, you can update this by using whatever it is that you want to do it. Um, it's, it's just a matter of, uh, of all of that. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I think it's, it's pretty cool that, that we have that available to us, uh, so we can uh, create that custom. We are not only tied to what is coming by default, right? Oh, exactly. Yeah. And, um, quite often when we, when we're running with the defaults, we have to be a little bit careful because it may it may not give us the retention or the information that we were hoping it would or that we assumed if we made a, a bit of an assumption on it so you know just that always that warning of you know 30 days goes a lot quicker than than we want it to sometimes and uh being able to set a custom retention is amazing so it can go up to 91 that's fantastic and that doesn't mean we have to use it. We exactly. Can use 45 days. So if we have specific queries, we can build around that for exporting that Azure activity log through process or something like that. We can kind of configure things a little bit more uh, in a Absolutely. custom way now. The next one is the general av available of log analytics that export in Azure Monitor. Um, that's a pretty good one. It's, it's GA. And now we are able to export those uh, data from Log Analytics into Azure Monitor and export then support the tables data that will automatically populate as they get supported. So um, the way that this works is now you can uh, create those export rules. You can define those export rules when you're moving that data um, to the Azure Monitor, they will starting to become supported and available for you. It's pretty cool to have this. So you can create a new generation of custom locks, correct? Absolutely, right? And what it allows us kind of that continuous process, right? So kind of one of the use cases that we commonly see here is other types of, let's say, security monitoring. I promise I'm not going to say Microsoft <laughs> Sentinel. At least this time. <laughs> right? I, won't, I promise I won't say it. So if, we, if we're if we exporting those Azure monitor logs, it allows kind of an A-based solution to help us analyze a more complete picture. And it allows us essentially to map outcomes of our infrastructure with other behavioral patterns that we can ingest into that um, analysis yeah. system. So not tied to any one solution in this case, but uh, it just happens to be kind of a pipeline that runs and, and moves the data. So um, I, I have had the opportunity to um, put this one in place um, a couple of times, I'll say, and it's actually really, really cool. Um, you can move a lot of data very quickly 
and it allows you to do a lot of really good yep. things. Um, there is some limitations with it. So, you know, read the MS Docs article. I, in my head, I always want to say KB, and I know that's not true anymore. <laughs> <laughs> read the MS Docs article and, um, you know, re just read up on it, understand the requirements, but also understand um, what some of the limitations might be as you go through an implementation of that. It is yeah, really fun. It is. It is really fun. Moving to the next one. General available of direct enterprise agreement on Azure cost management and billing. It's new times in this case for the uh, Azure cost management and billing with now direct enterprise agreement. So yes, uh, do you want to start with this? Because I think this is going to be a massive update. <laughs> You, you can yeah. see me trying to start talking. <laughs> I know I get too excited about this. So this one also has been a long time coming, right? So um, EA customers or enterprise agreement customers have long been asking, where is kind of a more granular management option? How can we get better reports out? How can we do a little bit better alerting from a cost perspective in there? So we're really starting to see Microsoft answering those questions that customers have been have been submitting um, for a little bit now. And this is really, really great. So this one allows us to have better integrated access with the invoicing, with the costing, but also understanding how our cost management policies are applying inside our EA. So if we have a dev test uh, subscription, we can really drill down in there and understand what pieces of the the tenant are are cost our subscription sorry are costing us money, and which pieces we should focus on for cost optimizations and analyze a little bit differently. Um, if we combine this with our previous cost management update of kind of that AI starting to get mixed into the the cookie recipe of cost management, we're starting to see some very powerful potentially automated outcomes that we can utilize uh, to help us really get a better picture and a better handle on our costs. Because often it's not the fact that something was $100 two months ago and $1,000 now. We can usually answer that question. The hard part is showing the data, showing what's being consumed and why it's different now to other members of management or uh, if you will, the yeah. bean counters in the company. We have to be able to communicate it in an effective way. Yeah, and right? so this it is, is really and it's cool. not only that because uh, you might think, but why why this is not available for enterprise agreement? Because usually enterprise agreement you are doing uh, where you are doing your licensing and you are doing all of that, and and usually Microsoft just uh, throw out uh, on that some of those consumption that you are doing and 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 some discounts and all of that different pricing and usually it's really difficult uh, with different pricing for different enterprise agreements because each enterprise agreement is totally different from each other right uh, to just yes. getting those costs because one of the things is when you're going for example the Azure calculator it's nothing to do with this but you get the price of the uh, of the uh, me and you in this case the normal mm -hmm. Joe yeah, you get like the, retail the retail price. Pricing, Enterprise right? agreement, they have a different price, right? And be able Old and be able to see what you are consuming of uh, and be able to project that. And having everything that you have on customer management, even if you are not on your cap or you are on your surpassing your cap that you have, anything like that, it's good to have those. And other things like be able to billing and be able to go there and doing simple things like downloading voices right and doing all of that was kind of those basic stuff that now it's available yeah, for them so, yeah so there there is a bit of an answer here too and we kind of um touched on it a little bit in the last cost management update today but one of the things that's kind of unwritten that we don't really talk about um, kind of publicly a whole lot is when you're an organization at the Azure EA level, it's almost assumed 
that you have a partner helping you manage that, a Microsoft partner. So I'll explain it a little bit because it might not make sense if somebody hasn't heard about yeah. all of these things before, right? Um, so for cost management, there's a partner portal. And under an enterprise agreement, your partner, your Microsoft partner, can help you drill down with a lot of these things, but even deeper, there's more to it. There's also value add uh, quite often when you're dealing with a partner and the partner can really help enhance the data, right? They may add some automation or human process or who knows what, but that's a value add. So now kind of the baseline of those features from the partner portal for cost management which did only apply to enterprise agreement customers is now available directly to the EA yeah. customers. So this this is kind of a big news. It's kind of um, decentralizing um, the those features from the partner portal and allowing us to do it on our own under our own EA. So this this is it is cool it stuff. is and 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 it's it's like like you said is overdue for those enterprise agreements. Uh, customers that they have it now they have that possibility to have that right yeah and i i apologize nobody else i know gets too excited about uh, cost management update <laughs> so the next one is, is a horrible mention uh right of of azure net app files so you usually we don't cover here uh, that part but this one uh, i think it was uh, worth mentioning of the generally available of Azure Net App files of a new region in cross-region application. Uh, That's right. The reason that we bring this is because we did talk about this not very long time ago, uh, about this in one public preview, especially on the cross-region um, cross application. Uh, so right now, the new uh, uh, region is the uh, Australia Central 2. And in addition to that, you are able to do the cross region application that is enabled already between the cross the uh, the Australia Central and Australia Central two as the region pair. So besides giving another region, they are already enabling the cross region replication within the Australia. It's pretty cool, right? Exactly. I actually have um, a totally ADD question about this. How do you think that? Microsoft data centers physically approach cooling in Australia? Oh, I don't know that. Um, probably they're using a lot of kangaroos to just spinning on the <laughs> on the, on a treadmill uh, and then generates yeah. some kind of uh, energy to just cooling off. I don't know. We need to or, work forward or, this, I think. Uh, I, en I envision a giant hamster wheel with a bunch of kangaroos or they put they put data centers in a place that they have a lot of palm trees and they make some kind of shade uh yeah lots probably of yeah. or uh, i don't know uh, i'm just kidding yeah i apologize it's just that's my that's mind. okay that's um, okay uh the the cross region replication is really important it is oh. but that um, that that's that just give me another thing it i was uh, um re reading a long time ago that was uh, the misconception of the eat the problem of the data centers it's the it's a combination of eat and uh, humidity right you cannot have both uh, you can only choose one <laughs> uh, that's right otherwise you get exactly on on the and, and, and even yeah. humidity is the worst enemy so the eat, yes, it's it's bad to have over eat, but if you have eat and dry, it's not as bad as as eat and humid. Yeah. yeah, data centers can actually run a lot warmer yes. temperature internally than people think. Um, it's always cold, really, when you go into a, like a, a a data center, but that's not necessarily yeah. to just be, you know because it's a big open space. They have like the hot and cold aisles, so the humans walk in the cold part, right? And, you, and it's yeah, and, and and let me let me clarify. It's not like I'm saying that that center can run at at 50 degrees. It's not that. What I'm saying is hotter than the normal. Uh, in this case, the normal temperature. So 
if the normal temperature is like 15 degrees there were some accidents that i visit that they were perfectly fine running at 20 22 degrees for example this is celsius of course um and uh, they were totally fine it's just a matter of if you establish that temperature um of course at the components you probably need to have a little bit more uh alert systems to just not having that variable too much to have that temperature but yes ideally well there, yeah there's, it, there's it is it. oh my like god you bring in a piece of new equipment you don't plug that equipment in usually for 48 hours you have to let it kind of acclimate or get used to the temperature remember on my old days of data center now the cloud is a doesn't that oh I my god it's like I'm so sorry. changing <laughs> the position of the of the server on the rack it's yep. totally change the 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 perception and the and the data not the data the the, the power consumption the everything it was like wow I, I and when i realized that that was like now i'm traveling in time like 15 years ago uh, something like that it was like it was a science we had we had applications one last thought we had application that were kind of um saying that if you have this type of server you need to put it because if your cooling is from the bottom to the up you don't want to pull the cool the cool the most hot one for example on the bottom because now you're putting a lot of hot air coming up and you are feeding that air to the so it's it was a science absolutely it is a science so my my final thought on the physicality <laughs> of data centers and positioning in the rack you, you really got brain turning here i worked with a fellow many years ago who was adamant that network switches high performance network switches must be on the bottom of the rack yeah okay was absolutely adamant and if you if you think about it he you know he would have really been talking about the same thing that that you're talking about right you have to pay attention to how the airflow works and of course switch is usually back just a like one one third to half down the rack depending on what the switch is but then the servers are the full length of the rack quite often so if you have a switch at the bottom that's putting out a lot of heat and they definitely can get hot too especially if it's a poe or anything like that then that switch is actually heating the server that's above it because some of that air is going to end up flowing yep. to the front and that's when you also have to get into the type of panels that you use for the spacing to make sure that you're blocking any hot air from coming to the front before it gets sucked into the next one up and shot out absolutely again, right? absolutely it's so and all of the kids are listening going yeah, guys old talking, about. talking about absolutely <laughs> let's let's move on before we just open the pandora box uh, i think it's time i'm so Let sorry everybody thank you for entertaining my uh my little yeah. diversion general let's go to the next one generally available utilizing multiple backups per day on azure files and in azure backup so this is pretty cool we finished with with one update that is really awesome because this allows you to the low recovery point is the key for this so utilizing multi backups per day uh, for azure files to recover that it's reduce that rpo tremendously right exactly yeah so it's more yes. frequent backups um capturing smaller amounts of change yeah. data so it's more efficient the backups run faster more frequently and of course like you mentioned reducing that rpo the the point in time that we have to recover yeah. to right so um it's a really cool update and i have to say the flexibility of how we can configure it's this it's is really immense. great because we can we can use of course our good friend the azure portal gui but we can also use your and mine good friends powershell and cli so now we can kind of scale the the changes that we need exactly. to make right so that's where the real power comes in and 
I think that this is a really cool update to end on um, for the episode this week because it's, I think, probably one of the most powerful and meaningful updates that we had. I, I can't pick one. I liked yeah. a lot of them this week. But this is this is a really it important is. one. And allow us to be really flexible because... I'm already thinking because of PowerShell and CLI, right? To be able to create a function that if you're starting to see a lot of, of files on specific storage account or whatever it is, uh, coming, coming, uh, or in a burst, you can trigger a faster, like you said, a backup to be able to recover. Because uh, to fast recover, to have... Uh, way less, way less data lost uh, 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 on your environment, and all of those type of things. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool to to have all of this. It's not only like you set up and forget. So you can create some kind of automation oh. and some kind of intelligence on on your environment to be able to do this to trigger multiple uh, snapshots, for example, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think my brain goes to a similar but slightly different path on this one. So the same thing, detecting a lot of like a high volume of file changes on servers and storage accounts should also trigger monitoring exactly. alerts so that we can investigate and make sure something terrible isn't kind of cooking in the background on us changing files all over the place. I'm not going to say any special yeah. words there. But having a very low um, uh, RPO is really kind of a, a super win here because we can build some flexibility, like you say, using Azure Functions, PowerShell, or CLI. And we can combine that with some of the cool features of uh, Azure Monitor, determine what's happening to those files, and either trigger an incident, be created for investigation, or trigger an extra backup because, oh, hey, somebody's updating a whole bunch of spreadsheets for the sales department. Let's make sure we grab an extra backup and capture those so that we have a, a good uh, low RPO yeah. in this case. Yeah, absolutely. Really cool. and, and be able to modify or even create a backup policy to take all of those on the fly. It's, it's, it's really important because it doesn't stop you to just creating, uh, in this case, uh, the normal policy. You can create and even modify to trigger all of those multiple backups per day so you can you can do this it's pretty it's pretty cool oh, exactly so with it that is. we coming end to our podcast um this week i know is the, is the saddest moment sa saddest moment of our week but we had to come uh, to an end right and what a, be a better way to do that so thank you once again andrew um Thank you for, for listening. You that you are seeing the podcast and listening to the podcast, please don't forget to subscribe. I know that is a shameless plug, but it, it helps us a lot. Uh, uh, it really does help the channel. It boosts us and allows other people to uh, learn about it exactly. as well. So uh, thank you again, Marcos, and thank you, of course, to our viewers and listeners as well. You are the reason Absolutely. we do this. So I hope that you like the podcast of this week, the episode of this week, and I hope I can see you uh, next week. So then bye for now.